ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> uh, first, I would like to thank Björn and Lars for inviting me the second time to Singapore. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> now we come uh, to a more clinical question. I'm from the Charité in Berlin. And you know, here is the logo of the Charité, research, teaching, healing, helping. Um, and we come now to the problem, the brain pancreas axis. Uh, why did I say this? I give you some numbers. In 1980, 4.7% of the whole world population um, had diabetes. In 2014, it was already 8.5%. So this is a main clinical problem now for internal medicine to combat. And this is really a challenge, diabetes in general. So, and the interesting point is, <coughs> during this increase, you have paralleled an increase in cardiovascular diseases and also in Alzheimer. So obviously, diabetes is an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease and Alzheimer. And <coughs> therefore, um, it uh, takes a lot of um, 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 we have a lot of, put a lot of money in this to solve the problem, really. What is the connection between the diabetes and, uh, and the Alzheimer, for example? Now, um, brain pancreas axis. If you go, obviously it is something with the glucose in the, uh, in the blood. And uh, the glucose is a controlled variable in physiological terms. And the insulin is obviously the adjustable variable. So there are a lot of feedback systems intermingled between each other, and they have already some delay. For example, when the glucose goes up, it takes, say, yeah, say some minutes, that the insulin lowers it again. So we have to uh, resolve this problem, especially in diabetes. This may give values which are much too high. After, for example, an excessive meal in, uh, with uh, carbohydrates. Now when you look here to the to the picture, the brain on the one side, uh, it's the hypothalamus and the hypophysis linked with the limbic cortex, which makes here the whole first regulation step. And then it goes down to the uh, suprarenal cortex, and, uh, and then it comes from there via adrenaline here to the, to the pancreas. On the other side, you see here uh, pancreas insulin resistance. In the American Diabetes Association, they said Alzheimer was called type 3 diabetes. Why type 3 diabetes? It's because it's meant the insulin resistance of the brain. So, now this is a very good uh, uh, point because we can, of course, combat the insulin resistance. Yeah, okay. Um, you see, sedentary lifestyle, one point. Second, obesity. Here you see hyperphagia. In the blood, it's a triglycerides in the blood and then skeletal muscle, insulin sensitivity of the skeletal muscle, clear, adipose tissue, and liver. And what you see here is 
always said here, what are the next steps in gene sequencing? And then you end up with pancreatic dysfunction. So the insulin is not adequately increased, and you have then a better cell development, which may be wrong, adipose senescence, glucose sensing, insulin secretion. All this may be not in the right way. So the question, in, uh, when you look to the cardiovascular diseases and to the Alzheimer, there is one thing which is common. That is, you have plaques. You have atherosclerotic plaques, and you have Alzheimer plaques. There is only one difference in between. In the Alzheimer plaques, they have additionally um, to, the, to the lipoproteins, they have the better amyloid. And so we went now down to the very beginning and looked what is an arteriosclerotic and here especially an Alzheimer plaque. So we have to go to the periphery and look how is, uh, are the lipoproteins taken up by the body. And they are taken up by uh, the LRP uptake only to 10%. LDL receptor, only 10%. That is in the, in the liver. But mainly we have heparin, sulfate, proteoglycan sequestration for taking up the lipoproteins in the periphery. The molecule, heparin sulfate, is also very complicated. It's about 100 nanometer and uh, standing out of the cell membrane. And um, it's an anionic polyelectrolyte. And, uh, polyanionic because of the side chains, separate sulfate and the chondroitin sulfate. And then you have a transmembrane domain and the short intracellular domain <coughs> is linked to the nitric monoxide synthase, which in the blood releases NO and makes a dilatation of the blood vessel. Now this molecule is viscoelastic and it can bind here in the receptor domain one and two can bind, for example, lipoprotein. Here it's shown for LDL. You see, uh, there are positive, LDL is a particle, <coughs> and all these blood lipoproteins are dipoles. So they have here a positive uh, epitope, which is connected then to the negative of the side chain. And here you see, it's easy to bind calcium on the other side. So you have here a ternary complex, that, which we call nanoplug. This is an, an arteriosclerotic nanoplug. And in the case of uh, the Alzheimer, we have beta amylid sitting on the lipoprotein. So we have a, t a quaternary complex. Then. <coughs> we isolate it, the lipoprotein, <coughs> and uh, put it on a silica surface and did some ellipsometry measurements. And uh, nowadays we know exactly the sequence here and we know exactly where, for example, LDL is binding and so on. Now, we did some ellipsometry measurements. There's only one point here to mention is that the solution, we have here a monolayer, and the solution here is complete. It's a blood substitute solution, and it is very important to have a, a constant pH because these molecules are very sensitive for pH changes. And we use um, two buffer, as in the body, bicarbonate and phosphate buffer. And it is bubbled, the solution is bubbled like in the lung with normal aeration process. <laughs> and uh, that is the only thing. Now we come to the results. We did here some measurements of nanoplug size, I mean, measured the thickness. And you see here, in this experiment, we use here heparin sulfate uh, and till absorption, also till the thickness was reached. And then <coughs> we added here IDL, intermediate density lab, because IDL and VLDL are the main constituents in Alzheimer's. And it has been described by Meili in Israel, uh, that these both lipoproteins 
especially in one form, E4, E4. The apolipoprotein protein E4, E4 homozygous leads in all patients earlier or later to Alzheimer in a, in a probability of 90%. So we used <coughs> mainly IDL apo I4, E4. And uh, you see, then it, uh, some nanoplugs are formed, especially with high calcium concentration. We did the calcium concentration curve. Here it goes tremendously up. When you do it with glucose, then it goes even more up. You see it here, especially. It's, it's nicely to see it starts earlier to grow up. And here it is not yet. And if you do it quantitatively, you see the red curve is the sugar curve, so to say, is over the black curve. And if you want it in percentage, then you see about 40% with high calcium is the increase sugar does. Why sugar? We let it stand the solution for only one day, overnight, not in the fridge. And then all the proteins, all the lipids are glycated as a non-enzymatic change. Now we come to the Alzheimer story. Here you see Alzheimer nanoplug size. And the black curve, again, is the um, is, um, <coughs> control curve. Uh, heparan sulfate protoglycan thickness is about here 100 nanometer or 80 nanometer. And then the ideal apple E4, E4 given. And when you add the beta amyloid, A beta, said here, it is clear that you have then a lot of uh, scatter. That means particles are formed. And then with the calcium, it goes up. And if you give glucose to the IDA before and to the R beta, then you have it even more. And if you come to the quantitative effect, the red curves are again over the black one. And here uh, you see the percentage change of the plug size, especially with high calcium. Now we have done a very interesting experiment to the, together with um, in the uh, with um, Irid Lubitz, uh, there is a, a large Israel um, American study on, uh, on APO E isoforms, also mixed isoforms, um, not homozygous, so to say. And we have used here an E4, E4, E4 homozygous. Uh, genotype patients, and one, uh, one group had diabetes and the other group not. And you see here, and the patients with the diabetes have been treated so they had, were completely, from the medical standpoint, completely OK. You see, we give no sugar here, and here we have the normal experiment. H, uh, uh, also heparan sulfate, protoglycan I, IDL, and then beta amylid. The black curve is again the control curve. And the control curve means a non-diabetic. And then with the diabetic, you see the red curve. It's over the other curve. And you see we did the first derivative of this is a nanoplug formation. It's an absorbed amount here. And you see the red curve is always over the black curve. So even though these people are treated, they have a memory or a, a signature, obviously, in their, in their lipoprotein, still um, remember that they have a diabetes. We don't know yet where this, is, um, where this signature is. Anyway. These people who are treated, nevertheless, they get Alzheimer. Um, you see here again the percentage, the red curve about, uh, above the black one, and here's the percentage <laughs> in, in change. It's not much here with this calcium concentration, but it's present. And then it comes with high calcium up. 
Um, now I come to the next point. And this is here that this heparan sulfate is as well a flow sensor. I said it is connected to the NO synthase. And you see here, this molecule has under no flow, flow conditions in the, in the blood a random coil and there's sodium calcium bound. And when you increase flow, because it is viscoelastic, it's unfurling. And you see also the helical advance. It's a <coughs> two one left handed helix is stretched from 1.92 nanometer to a almost 2 nanometer. So, and then it, sodium is flowing in the cell and dilates the blood vessel. So we come now, we did some experiments, very simple experiments. And um, these are flow experiments. You see, in the flow experiments were done only in human uh, arterial segments from heart transplantations, coronary, se se uh, coronary arteries, from explanted hearts, and also brain arteries from neurosurgery. So it's a living in vivo system, just to show you what happens here. And we were completely uh, overwhelmed by the facts. You see here, human coronary artery. This is a nice flow-dependent dilatation curve, control curve. You see, when the flow increases, the tension of the, uh, of the artery wall is going down, the vessel dilates, the blood perfusion is better. Oppositely, when the, when the flow goes down, it contracts. A wonderful flow-dependent dilation curve. When you add LDR, low-density lipoprotein, you see you have a constriction as the difference between the starting point and the end point is diminished. And you see, so you are on a, only from the LDL on a higher level. But still, you have a flow-dependent dilation. But when you add now sugar as a glucose, look at this here. The beginning, at low flow, even a strong, uh, higher tension in the vessel, and the dilation is, is much worse. So we thought, aha, this is the LDL, but we know that HDL, the good lipoprotein, is protective. And we thought, aha, perhaps we are protected by HDL. Look here, glucose. This is, so the nanoplugs, so to say, HDL has normally no nanoplugs in that sense. You see, this is the control curve. HDL shows a wonderful dilation much down here and this is just saying we have no uh, nanoplugs on, on, on with HDL on the heparan sulfate but when we add sugar here so this dilatation is so to say impaired and now comes the worst thing again so we're thinking that this nanoplug formation is on the sensor, on the blood flow sensor, and diminishes the, the blood flow. And here we have, which is very rare, you get these arteries. You can imagine no patient wants to give, give his arteries from the brain from consciousness areas. It is, I mean, <laughs> it's, um, it's from the hippocampus. And perhaps one to two times per year, one gets such a tumor operation. And very tiny vessel then. You see, normally, we have a wonderful flow-dependent dilation here. Vessels uh, becoming wider uh, when the flow increases. And now, giving VLDL, in this case, APOE4, E4, so the worst case. And you see, flow dilation is much impaired. It's, uh, so to say, the Alzheimer protein here, lipoprotein. And then we give the beta amylate 42, also this isoform, which uh, is responsible for Alzheimer, uh, the tangles and so on uh, under, um, in Alzheimer people. And you see practically no dilation anymore. That means, what does it mean clinically? It means a very bad, it's a 80% 
decrease in blood perfusion in this brain area. And the neurons have about 30 second, <laughs> seconds of time, then they are dead. So, so the, it's obviously quite clear that if you have, say, postprandially high levels of glucose, then these vessels contract and some neurons will die. And you do it perhaps your life long. It takes some time and you know, Alzheimer is mainly a disease uh, which uh, starts with elder uh, aged people. Now it's even more younger because they like sedentary lifestyle and so on. I, I don't know. So I, this was the end. Like we, we conclude. Glycated, heparin sulfate, ideal apoifure, and beta amylate promoted both atherosclerotic and Alzheimer nanoplug size and also formation we have measured as compared to non-diabetics. Glycated, heparin sulfate, proteoglycan, VLDL, APOE4, and beta amyloid 42 inhibit flow-dependent dilatation by more than 80% in isolated human brain arteries, as exactly as is in the body short-term significantly increased blood glucose levels in a IPOE4, E4 carriers may explain neuronal cell deaths like in Alzheimer's disease. So this is a completely new site on Alzheimer. It has, from this point, anyway, an additional vascular component because nobody has described this till now. And... Uh, of course, one could ask, what can we do? We have to look for that, as so I for myself, I have restricted my chocolate intake <laughs> tremendously. And uh, I think uh, one can think of, about this. Uh, I think this is a big problem. American Diabetes Association uh, is Every announcement is a combat diabetes, combat diabetes. So you, there's also a, what is a foundation where you can pay in to help them to decrease uh, the sugar. Some years ago it was the fat, now it is the sugar. In the one case we have the statins, in the other case we don't know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we have some questions. Very, very simple uh, question concerning, you told about glucose and sugar, that it's uh, dangerous, really. And you also demonstrated data concerning calcium. Calcium, yeah. Yes. Uh, its role, well, of course, it's very important for living body. <laughs> the presence of calcium is very important. Is there is a high level, low level, it's how it influences on the disease? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. Also, you may have, some people may say, ah, he used 17 millimolar calcium, people are dead when they have it in the blood. The point is, these polyelectrolytes have counter ion condensation theory, you know. It's condensed calcium is still in solution with 17 millimolar close to the molecule. So if you use, we have done some big clinical trials with statins, Novartis, yeah? And we could show really that the statins, I must say, even under these high calcium conditions, say lower nanoplug formation. So this is perfectly working with the high calcium and even better. And also here you see it. The same thing. So the calcium uh, is, in the case of uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, is a, a big discussion. People who have too much calcium do say further, so to say, a plaque uh, formation. And the same is, uh, is Alzheimer, because Alzheimer plaques are also calcified plaques. 
There are only three papers worldwide, and they show the Alzheimer's plaque, the chemical composition is clear, but there's not many people working on it, because they are very tiny, and obviously you don't get it. Yeah, you must, uh, so to say, isolate a lot of these plaques post-mortem, which is not, <laughs> so this is some task. And, but it is calcium. So the question is not clear. Should one, if, if somebody has, because of bone disease, yeah, should take vitamin D or not? Uh, because you have then calcium uptake too high. Perhaps I further than plaque formation and heart attack. It's not decided yet. It's always the same discussion which you ask now, which is clear. Very complicated, yeah. Okay, are there any more questions? If not, then let's thank the speaker.